All right, well, thank you for making time to join us today for our March CISMA webinar. Um, we are hosted by um, what's formerly the Florida Invasive Species Partnership. We've merged with the uh, Florida Invasive Species Council, and we're excited to be um, wrapping all of that up with a new name and hopefully new logo soon after the um, Fisk Invasive, um, their annual symposium next month. Uh, this month, we are um, going to hear about non-native fish and wildlife control with the um, FFWCC from Michaela Spencer. Uh, Michaela is a, the non-native fish and wildlife program coordinator for the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, FWC. She received her BS in zoology from the U University of Florida and her MS in biology from Austin Pay State University with a thesis on comparative physiology and behavior of copperhead and cottonmouth snakes. She worked for over three years with invasives on Guam, including brown tree snakes, um, before working with Burmese pythons and other invasives in Florida. In her current position with the FWC, she oversees the non-native fish and wildlife program. And I'm gonna go ahead and hand control over to her now. All right, let me go ahead and share my screen. And um, if you have any questions during the presentation, please feel free to go ahead and put those in the chat and we'll answer those at the end of the presentation. All right, yep, I'm seeing your screen. Fantastic. All right. Well, I'll go ahead and get started then. I'm really excited to be here today. Um, I think it's probably been a little while since the FWC has done an update or given an update on, on our non-native fish and wildlife program. And there have been some pretty big changes in the past few years. So really excited to be giving this update and able to kind of expand on what some of those changes are and what those changes have meant for the program and for some of the work we're now able to do, even more work we're able to do with partners. So that's that's going to be the focus of today's talk, and I, I'm kind of going to walk through that um, through just very big, quick overview of non-natives, um, recognize the audience. Many folks on this call are very, very familiar, so I'm probably going to move through that information relatively quickly so I can spend a little bit more time discussing FWC's program itself and some of our changes and expansions we've had over the past few years, and then discussing what those changes have really meant for us being able to really take this multi-pronged approach to non-native and invasive species control here in the state. So we're going to kind of start here just as I said with a quick overview of non-natives. So I like to use this publication's map because it's just so quick and simple to, to interpret. So red being high amount of non-native or in this case they call them alien species and um, <laughs> blue being low. If you look at this map, not a lot of red spots on that map, probably less than 10. So we zoom into the U.S. and yes, Florida is a hot spot for non-native species in the world. So it doesn't come as much of a surprise when we tell folks that we have a very robust program and we've been able to luckily make that program even more robust over the past few years. And so just across the state, non-native species and invasive species control is a priority because of, I mean, simply this, we have a lot of those species. So in general, Florida has a lot of really cool native species. You know, we have, we have native birds, reptiles, mammals, and unfortunately there's this mirror of also having a lot of these non-native species such as cane toads, Burmese pythons, iguanas, tegus, tons of non-native fish. We have a few non-native mammal species. So what does this look like in terms of numbers? So we've had approximately 127,000 observations of non-natives here in the state. And that's just the number that are reported to us. That is not including lionfish observations. I just really want to point that out because we're going to actually talk a little bit more in detail about that here in a second. Over 550, so these 120,000 observations are represented by about 550 non-native, different individual non-native species. And we figure at least 139 of these species are reproducing at this point. We actually think that number is higher and we are working on trying to get, get at what that higher number is. That's one of our current kind of projects we're working on. And so I like to just show lionfish. So this is a map from 2020. If we updated this, essentially these, these red dots would just be, um, we would see even more of these red dots over the past few years on this map. But the reason I like to say that those observations above don't include lionfish is we've removed over, over 165,000 lionfish since 2016. So that's just removed. That's not the number just observed. Um, so, which would be obviously much higher. So yes, very easy. When you just look at some basic, basic numbers about why non-native species are a problem in our state. So one of the reason that, reasons they are such a problem here in Florida is because there are so many introduction pathways into the state. So we have unintentional hitchhikers. 
um, there's intentional release or escape of captive non-native species. So when we're talking about fish and wildlife, not plants. So I want to be clear for today's talk, I am not going to be talking about plants. Um, the FWC does have an entire invasive plant management section, but that is not what we do in our section that I'm going to be talking about today. So just fish and wildlife today. So when we're talking about fish and wildlife, the intentional release or escape of captive non-native species is actually currently the most common pathway we're seeing for non-native species currently getting into the state of Florida. Yeah. And so Jerry's for us, take a walk. So for, oh, I think we might have someone unmuted on accident. But for us, so obviously for the state, it's a priority to prevent introductions of high risk non-native species. So prevention is key. And we'll talk a little bit about, about that a little bit more in a second. So invasive species in Florida, so I keep saying non-native, obviously many of us know with invasive species, they are taking that next step up. So there are non-native species that has been found to cause negative impacts to Florida's economy, human health and safety, or the environment. And so we do have many established invasive species in the state that are a high priority. And we already discussed why Florida is so susceptible to invasive species. Um, one in particular, we talked about those multiple ports of entry, but Florida's also historically had this very robust live animal trade industry. And also we happen to have this very subtropical climate that happens to aid in establishment. So we don't get that cold winter that a lot of animals aren't able to survive. So further up north, like in Maine, you know, a green iguana would not, according to all of our statistics, be able to survive because the winters are too cold. And in Florida, we don't, they, we don't have those cold winters. So obviously these invasive species are causing a slew of impacts. So I'm gonna very quickly go over some of these. There are so many that we could go over. So there are a lot of ecological impacts, um, direct predation. So we see a picture here of a Argentine black and white tegu eating an egg, um, habitat alteration. Many of you know how green iguanas are great burrowers and that causes a lot of problems with habitat. Competition for resources. I mean, one very easy competition for resources if is, you know, with large snakes, they're eating similar things that our native snake species would eat. So therefore they're taking away some of those resources for our native species. And then disease or parasite introduction and transmission. Um, Burmese pythons alone, there are multiple parasites and diseases we found in Burmese pythons. Many folks have probably heard of the, um, it's a crustacean, it's a pentastome that is found, it's a parasite found in the lung. It has been transmitted to native snake species from Burmese pythons. It was introduced through Burmese pythons and our native snake species have further transmitted it to other native snake species, including the protected indigo snake. And we actually uh, just had our first death in, of an indigo snake where they necropsied it and the death um, was ruled to be by pentastomes because it, it was it had such a high pentastome load that they think that's what likely caused its death. So this is also another problem and another very big impact that's happening from these invasive species. And there's also economic impacts. I'm going to go back to that green iguana. That's a pretty simple one. Those burrowing habits that green iguanas have, they like to burrow underneath roadways. They like to burrow next to canal banks. Well, those canals sometimes get weak enough that they fall in. And then it's very expensive to fix those waterways. Very expensive to fix the, those inf the infrastructure that iguanas are breaking down. Human health and safety impacts. Um, if we think of just primates, you know, we're always thinking of, of humans generally first when we're looking at human health and safety. And primates can transmit a lot of diseases that humans can catch. So there can be a lot of negative impacts that invasive species can cause here in the state, which is why they are such a priority for us to control. So I, you know, we mentioned earlier that it's a high priority, priority for the agency to prevent non-native and invasive species from ever becoming a problem in the state. This is very difficult to do. And I'm, I'm gonna discuss this a little bit more later on new things that we're trying to do to further work on putting more effort towards this prevention step. Because when we look at this invasion curve, area infested over time and control cost, obviously prevention is the best place to be with any species. It costs the least, you have the least amount of impacts, least amount of time, but it is a very difficult thing to do because you're essentially for a lot of this trying to predict the future. Then you get the introduction event and then you have eradication containment. Obviously we work really hard to try and get animals quickly if there's a chance that they're gonna become established. But of course we do have species that are in that long-term management part of the curve, such as the Burmese Python, such as the Argentine black and white tegu. So kind of an overview about how FWC is addressing some of these problems. 
So I always like to point out that the FWC is unique in looking at other when, when comparing it to some other state agencies in that we have this constitutional authority over regulations and management of fish and wildlife resources in Florida. So most of the time, the authority to create rules and regulations is, is designated to the legislature. In the state of Florida, it was the constitutional authority was given to FWC. Um, this essentially means that we can implement the rules based on risk determination. And we, I mean, we try to implement rules based on risk determination, but we can implement rules on fish and wildlife. These rules are separate from statutes and these rules do carry the full force and effect of the law. So there, there's arguments to be made, the positives and negatives of this. I'd say a positive is sometimes this means that we can sometimes move things a little bit quicker when something does need to be regulated. Um, it's also kind of unique in that within this agency, we have this constitutional authority to make rules and regulations. We also have a big enforcement factor. Um, many folks on this call know and have worked with uh, FWC's law enforcement. And we also have biologists and researchers. We have an entire research division. So it's kind of great because all within one roof, we're able to do a lot of these different things and aspects that are needed for Florida Fish and Wildlife um, management. So I mentioned a little bit about taking this multi-pronged approach to non-native control, and I'm actually going to be breaking down here in this next section how we're doing this. And I'm going to use these big common themes because most of the control we're doing falls within one of these themes. So we've got communication, control, monitoring, policy and regulation, and research, all very important aspects, everything very important to kind of put together this huge puzzle of control in the state. So what does that multi-pronged approach look like? So before I get started, when I say multi-pronged approach, I keep talking about FWC and all these things with FWC. This, none of this would be possible without our interorganizational relationships. We work with other organizations. I, I don't even know if I could think of a single project that is singular just to our organization. Um, it, it, it takes a village on the, in this case. This is a across the state problem. There's not gates out in the middle of the Everglades that are you know, keeping animals on one side versus another land area. I mean, these animals are crossing across the landscape. It's very fluid for them. And so we all have to work together if we want to control non-native and invasive species. And I have a few on here. This is like a drop in the bucket of these interorganizational relationships. I wanted to try and make sure there was a diversity of some coverage. You know, we've got some federal and we've got local and other state organizations, tribal, um, universities. I mean, we, we have a lot of in our organizational relationships that we all rely on. And us all being a CISMA, I think we all recognize how important these relationships are. So I'm gonna kind of start just, I first kind of just wanna cover a little bit more of what we're doing in the policy and regulation sector. So I also meant to kind of highlight a little earlier. I discussed how FWC's had a bit of an expansion these past few years. Um, in particular, this last year, we received, we were lucky from the legislature that we received um, some new positions within our program. And we also received a, a big increase in our recurring budget. So what that's let us do is go from having, we used to have six wings in our program. We now have seven wings in our program and we have almost 30 staff just working on non-native fish and wildlife control, which is fantastic. I mean, it was needed. And I, I think there's still an argument made that we still have more expansion hopefully to come. Um, but that's allowed us to start doing a lot of the projects and a lot of the things I'm going to discuss today and even make some of these more robust. And we're hoping to continue doing more in the future. So with policies and regulations, just a quick overview. Um, so within FWC, we have one set of categories we call our captive wildlife regulatory classifications. So this is class one, class two, class three, going from high risk to low risk, and then our venomous species. And these categories more, when animals are placed in these categories, they're more focusing on uh, human health and safety. That's where a lot of these category animals placed in these categories are going. So if they're a high risk to human health and safety, they tend to be a class one species. And then, you know, obviously going down that change, low risk becomes like a class three. And then venomous species generally speaks for itself. So with species that are placed in these categories, there may be restrictions on importation and possession that could require a license or multiple licenses. Sometimes there's training with those licenses. Yeah. There can be different things depending on the species. We also have um, two other, we also have another set of regulatory classifications that are more focused on the ecological and economic impacts that species can have on Florida's native wildlife. 
So we have two categories in that case. We have conditional species and we have prohibited species. And there are different things that are regulated within these categories. So you can see here with conditional species, for instance, they're not allowed as pets. But there's some other things that are allowed, such as import and possess for breeding for the purpose of commercial sale. Now, I do want to caveat by saying that all conditional species, and prohibited species, anything someone is doing with these species um, does require a permit. So we do have a lot of different permit categories. And if anyone ever has further questions on that, feel free to reach out to me. Um, but then you can see when we go up to prohibited species, there are more restrictions on what those species can be used for. We generally have uh, exhibition and research um, open. And again, people do have to get permits for these things. And there are certain things that have to be followed to get those permits. But I always like to tell people, anyone can apply for a permit. That doesn't necessarily mean that you'll meet the conditions to get the permit, but anyone can apply. Because I've been asked by folks, can I even apply? And it's like, well, yes, anyone can apply for a permit. Um, so anyway, so that's another set of regulatory classifications that FWC has. And we continue to build on and we're hopefully continuing to work with, we have a technical assistance group where we're working with a variety of stakeholders right now. And we're hoping to continue building on the on these classifications and how animals get into these classifications. So hopefully more to come in the next few years on this front. So I mentioned earlier, we were looking at that invasion curve and prevention is really where we want to be. Best case scenario, we just prevent an animal from being a problem. Now, does that mean we ever know we actually prevented an animal from being a problem? We don't know. We hope that if an animal doesn't become established and we have we had maybe went underwent some preventative measures, that maybe the reason it didn't become established or become a problem for the state is because of those measures. But it's a hard thing to measure because if they don't ever become a problem and you had done some of these measures, maybe, we don't know. Did it work? Did it not? Um, so we, we hope these preventative measures are working. And one of them is, I, I keep mentioning this risk screening. And it's something that we are using more and more with a variety of species. So we're running them through. There are many different ways to look at risk of a species becoming a problem for the state. And this is a very small list. This doesn't even include stuff like pathways that animals be can become established. Excuse me. Um, so there are so many other factors and there are so many tools we can use to risk screen that can help give us information as to is there a higher or lower risk that an animal could possibly become a problem here in the state. A lot of factors go into that. So usually we pair these with what we call biological profiles, which has a lot of this background information that would then go into different risk screening tools. And then we take all of that information, all of those outputs, sometimes from a variety of risk screens, we look at biological profiles, and then we'll even work with experts to determine what is the chance that this animal could become a problem, that they could become established if they, if they were to become established, that they would be an ecological risk to the state. And so this is just another tool we're using that we're hoping to be able to further use in the future to determine, do we need to regulate a species or not? So that's just a bit on policy and regulation. So we're gonna look at some control and monitoring next. So early detection rapid response. This is a tool that honestly could fit in a few different categories, but um, we put it in control and monitoring. Um, and we actually do this through a hotline. So we've got in, I've got one invasive species hotline, and we've also got a website and an app. And so we receive reports from the public about non-native and invasive species through all of these mechanisms. Um, our hotline is open Mondays through Fridays, eight to five. And then of course we will take any messages that during our next business day and respond to those. Um, so we get these reports and of course there has to be some sort of a vetting mechanism because we receive a lot of reports, which is fantastic. We want that. And we tell people all the time, we'll go through this a little bit more that these reports, they matter. Um, even if we're not able to respond to something. So some quick little things we'll use when we get a report is, is that report credible or verified? So we're using a few different things that we're receiving from the reporter to determine this. One of them a lot of times being a photo. Um, I, I cannot tell you how many how many photos we get of corn snakes where people think it's a Burmese python. So um, and, and through no fault of anyone, that's not not a problem. But it's a this is why we have the vetting process, because if we were responding to every call and every corn snake, we would have no time maybe to respond to some of the other higher priority invasive and non-native species. We also will look at the species itself. Is it a high priority species? Um, do we have the capacity to respond? Do we have someone available? That's just a factor we have to take into account. Luckily, we've built quite the network. And I say we, I'm going to say that those inner organizational partners have been key to this. Um, and they're part of that network. 
um, key set of responders across the state because this is a statewide problem and we get calls from all over the state. And um, so we will tap into that network when we do need to respond, we'll tap into that network. And so it has made it so that we are able to respond to a lot more of these calls when needed. And then of course, as I was just saying, that response team can be a diversity of folks. So it can be our staff, it can be agency partners, um, it can be, we have, we've built our volunteer network across state. We continue to build that volunteer network. And we do have a hundred paid Python contractors down here in South and Southwest Florida. And luckily we've built into those programs, a mechanism for them to be able to be paid to respond to large constrictor EDRR reports. And then as, as another part of our, this is, I mean, this kind of also falls into our communication area. Some of these definitely cross um, some of these some of those categories, but we tell the public all the time, get involved And one easy way you can get involved is just report non-native species, use the app, go to our website. Um, these reports are extremely important for us. They help us understand, um, sometimes they're the first things we're figuring out that there might be a new population of non-native species <laughs> popping up in an area. Um, we use this information to figure out if ranges are, are starting to expand on certain non-native or invasive species. So. We use this information for a lot of things. So we, and we also always like to tell people, please include in those reports, a quality photo, location, and the date you're reporting. Those are like the three key elements we absolutely at minimum need to be able to really be able to use that report and, and use a lot of that information from that report. So um, another one is we do a lot of Python control and management. They are a high priority species for our agency. And honestly, I think for, for a lot of um, Floridians for control, and so we have the FWC Python Action Team Removing Invasive Constrictors. And this is paired with our sister program, the South Florida Water Management District Python Elimination Program. So this is those 100 contractors, 50 on in, within each program, that are working across mostly South and Southwest Florida. We've expanded to a few other areas, um, but they're mostly working in those two regions to remove pythons. Um, and I'm actually going to show here on this next thing a, a map of what that or a, a graph of how that removal has looked over the years. But we're able to pay them for not only their removal of snakes, but also their survey effort. And we're able to track that survey effort. And we're doing a lot with that data. So we've got some really cool stuff I think that's going to be coming out here in the next year or two that shows what what survey effort looks like to remove pythons. Um, yeah, it takes a lot of time to find a Python, even when you've been doing it for a long time. Uh, I think we're finding on average like nine hours is the average of per, per snake over the year. And that's by contractors that know what they're looking for. So it is definitely a lot of work to find a Python. Um, they're very good at hiding, very low detection. We also pay contractors for nests. We also pay them for scout snakes. So we have these research scout snakes across the landscape with multiple programs. We want to support those programs. Um, we get a lot of really good data and information from those snakes. So uh, we, we, when a contractor finds them, they have a set of parameters they use to take photos and stuff to submit to us so that we're not disturbing those research pythons. And so I mentioned showing that graph of removal. So these programs started in 2017. And as you can see, the green is contractor program Python removal. The blue is what's been reported to us. So I wanna be clear on that. What's been reported to the FWC as pythons removed across the landscape. You can see that since the Python programs, the paid programs started, um, there has been a significant increase in removals due to those programs. We've actually reached a point now where there's been more Pythons reported the FWC has removed from the programs themselves than all the other programs combined, which is pretty impressive. So we're now over 19,000 Pythons killed and reported to the FWC. Um, there's also Executive Order 2316. So this was actually updated just last year. and we updated it because we used to only have, it was 26 commission managed lands, and now we have 32 commission managed lands that year round, there's authorized lethal take of invasive reptiles, invasive and non-native reptiles, which is phenomenal. This is a way that the public can engage and do help us do removal and even just help us with reporting non-native species. Um, they do have to follow land area regulations, but they do not need a hunting permit. They do not need a hunting license. And one exciting thing about 20, Executive Order 2316 we were able to add is we were able to add captive bolt stunners into this executive order as a tool that people can use. It has to be non-modified, but as a tool people can use on any of these 32 commission managed lands to humanely kill any invasive reptiles they take. Um, 
that was something that was a little confusing in the past. And so folks didn't know if they were allowed to bring it out. And it's a very humane tool to use for humanely killing invasive reptiles. So we were pretty excited that all the land managers for these 32 commission managed lands agreed that this was a tool they thought would be fine to, for people to bring out them and using um, for this lethal take. And then of course we really support that pr on private lands, like remove non-native and invasive reptiles on your private lands, huge support, but make sure that you have private landowner permission first. And with some of these animals, they are conditional prohibited species. So they do have to be humanely killed um, at the place of capture. They cannot be live transported without the correct permits. So I know we're getting a little close to time here. So we're gonna cover some communication uh, non-native control mechanisms. So Florida Python Challenge. Uh, there are folks that are a little surprised that this isn't in our management and control section. It's because for us, the Florida Python Challenge, not just us, us, our partners, um, this is about raising awareness about invasive species issues here in the state of Florida by actively engaging the public in, in removal of a non-native or of an invasive species, the Burmese python. So this, it's, it's a python removal competition on seven public lands in South Florida. But the big thing here is it provides a lot of education and outreach. It, it reaches not only a statewide audience, but a national and international audience. Combined, we've looked at the stats with our communications team. This one event reaches more people in the entire year than all of our other outreach and communication initiatives combined. Um, it's amazing. So that is what this is for us. This is a very big um, raising awareness about invasive species. And that's why we've made this a big part is why we keep doing this Florida Python Challenge annually. Now, cash prizes are awarded. We also do a Python Safe Capture trainings. There is a required training before folks can even register. And in our 2023 event last year, we had over a thousand people register, which was phenomenal. It covered 35 different states and we did remove 209 pythons, which was also really great. Um, we also have the Exotic Pit Amnesty Program. I am not going to go in depth on this program. It's a phenomenal program. We could do a whole presentation on this program alone. So I put this program in the communications area. It was initially started, and brilliant idea for a program to start, is that I mentioned earlier that a lot of non-native species um, are coming through the accidental or intentional release of animals from captivity. Well, we wanted to give way back in the day, and I say we, again, this was a partner thought through effort, um, we wanted to be able to give folks a way to not be afraid to give up their non-native or invasive species they had of pets. If they couldn't keep it or they didn't think they could come in compliance with new rules or regulations for that species, we wanted to give them an alternative. And so that's the exotic pet amnesty program. So amnesty is key in the term here. The FWC is able to offer amnesty. So if someone were to come to us, for instance, let's say with a Burmese python and they have it as a pet and they're realizing, oh my gosh, I've had this thing illegally now for years. I just didn't know. And they don't want to get in trouble. They don't think they can come in compliance with the rule. And so they contact our amnesty program. They cannot be under active investigation by law enforcement. That is the only caveat. And that is very rare. So the majority of folks coming to us are not under an active investigation. So they come to us, contact us through our email, through our hotline, and we're able to provide them an amnesty letter. There are some caveats in that letter, like it lasts for 90 days, you have to stay in contact with us. But generally they get that letter and then we start working with them. And I, Jan Four um, with FWC runs this program and I love her term. She says, we're a matchmaking service at this point. <laughs> and it's a great term because essentially what we're doing is we're taking those, those people who wanna give their animals their exotic pets or their non-native pets up for adoption in the state of Florida and we are matching them with somebody that legally can take that animal. So if it's an animal where someone does need permits, we're making sure that person already has those permits, that they're going to essentially be able to take this animal, hopefully for the life of that animal, and provide it a good home, a forever home. And so we've not only built this within the state of Florida, in the past few years, we've expanded nationally. We now have a national network of adopters and we have mechanisms it's been fantastic. We've worked with Southwest Airlines, so we're able to ship animals out of state to these out of state adopters. Hey, Ashley, and how are you? It's it's been great. Um, so this is another program that has really, really expanded. I know I'm getting really close on time here. So again, if you have any questions about exotic pet animals program, I can definitely answer those later. There's so many cool things about that program. I'd love to be able to share. And so last but not least, I want to talk about research. So I knew I was going to be getting close on time with this presentation. So unfortunately, I'm not going to go into the 
plethora of research. Again, that's another area I could do a whole presentation on. I'm just going to cover some quick innovative control things that we are supporting and some of our partners are supporting, but this is like not even a drop in the bucket as to all the research that is ongoing with non-native and invasive species. So we are converting a lot of stuff over to phone data collection. Our um, contractor programs, all of that data is now collected through phone data collection apps, which has just made them so much more efficient. Um, we are working with programs for AI traps, you know, just an AI in general. We think there's a lot of application to using artificial intelligence in the future, even for things like helping us detect these species like the Burmese python that are extremely difficult to detect. Um, this top photo is actually a Burmese python under near infrared, a near infrared 850 nanometer camera. Um, we're working with near infrared technology to help us better detect different species. We're working on uh, putting some of this technology on drones. So drones are a great new piece of technology that uh, moves across the semi-aquatic landscape of the Everglades much better than humans do. So another great tool that we're looking for new innovative ways we can use to help us detect and hopefully find some of these hard to detect non-native and invasive species. So with that, I think I'm like right at 30 minutes. So I wanna take and give time for anyone to ask any questions you might have about our program. Thank you everyone. Thank you very much, Michaela. Um, I'm not seeing anything in the chat yet, but I do have a question. You mentioned you get a um, lot of reports from the public. Um, do you have a ballpark on how many, like weekly or monthly on average? I would have to look it up, but right now, like generally, so we do monthly reports. Um, and I don't think there's been a month in a long time where we've had less than 100 phone calls, just calls to the hotline. So that's not even our app and our um, website reports. So I think we're getting no less, I mean, I, no less than 100 phone calls on their own. Um, I think last year we had over like 17 or 1800 phone calls to the hotline. And again, that's just hotline calls. Okay, cool. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions. Open it up if there are some um, other people on the call that would like to ask something. Yeah, I have a question. This is James Leary. Sorry, I couldn't find my hand to raise. Uh, very good talk, Michaela. Thank you for sharing uh, your updates. Um, going back to your uh, contractor Python program, you showed some amazing results where when you implemented, there was a dramatic increase in capture. Do you have, a, do you have any knowledge of the cost of the program and any uh, any uh, opinions on the economy of it, return on investment. Is there an opportunity to expand that program, et cetera? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, yeah, I actually managed that program for three years. So I have a very good insight, <laughs> at least on the FWC side. And we know that the districts tends to be very similar. We're very in step with what we pay contractors and, and how much contractors are across the landscape. Um, but we were looking at, we usually stayed between 200 to 300,000 a year. And that's just in what we paid out to contractors. So that's not taking into account the um, staff time it takes to manage the program. We have about now, since we've transferred over to the new app system, um, it takes at least one person essentially full-time managing that program. And then we have a few other biologists who are obviously doing little things here and there that are helping with the program. Um, so uh, that's not factoring in those costs because you'd always want to factor in, you know, staff time and stuff like that. So, but just as one number, like 200 to 300,000 is what it's costing just for payout. And then we did some really rough numbers a few years ago. So don't quote me on this. These are really rough. Like we just threw them together because we were kind of curious as to just that question is how much is it roughly costing in, um, per Python for the contractor programs versus other programs like scout snakes and, uh, some of these other methods that people are trying to use. And it's actually been published. There was in 2023, uh, there was a publication. It was a synthesis on Burmese pythons. And it was like 30 something authors on it. Um, FWC helped. It was great. It was management researchers. It was a multi-year effort. There's actually a table in that publication that compares cost of different control mechanisms for pythons. And so this number is in there and it's a more exact number, but I think it was around two to $300 a python. Uh, to remove. So that's, and that by far so far has been the cheapest per Python control mechanism we have seen when we look at like dogs, like detector dog programs, or we look at scout snake programs. Does that help answer your question? 
It did. Thank you. And, you know, I guess an open question, don't expect you to be able to answer, but thinking about that invasion curve and the cost of finding pythons easier when there are a lot of them, as you start to bring that population down, I would expect that cost to go up per, per unit. So it's hard to say with population because unfortunately, because pythons are so difficult to detect, we do not have a way to figure out population yet. We actually have a few different research projects we are that we are supporting that are very innovative new ways to look at trying to get at populations for low detectable species such as pythons. Um, so we're hoping to have a way to do that in the next few years. But we have found that on the periphery of where we expect is the pythons current established range, we will do work on those areas. And we do find that you do have to put a lot more effort, which is essentially money, um, you know, hourly effort to find one python, likely because when you get to the edge of any established species range, there's they're less dense in that area. So it is harder than to find a single animal because there's not as many animals to find. Um, so yeah, we expect that, you know, if we were to follow that same logic, that if we were decreasing population in one area, then to find a python because there's less pythons to find will require more effort, which therefore requires more money and is more expensive. So, good question. Yeah, yeah, good questions and great presentation. Any other questions? Um, we have one coming in on the chat. Do you know of any in, um, research for invasive fish species and how to remove them? Yeah, so we do a lot of stuff with invasive fish. Um, there's some really cool stuff that's hopefully coming soon, stuff that USGS uh, is, is working on and um, US ACE is working on, and we're working in step with them. Uh, again, this is always partners. We're all meeting all the time together. So whenever I say we, let's just assume it's the conglomerate we of Florida organizations. Um, but uh, so there's more coming on monitoring efforts, such as using more eDNA monitoring, um, having more regular monitoring around the state for new, possibly new areas where new non-native species, non-native fish species in particular, and new non-native aquatic species are possibly starting to show up. Right now, a lot of what we're using for monitoring is electrofishing. Um, we have done some eDNA work. Uh, there are some other, depending on the species, sometimes minnow trapping will be used to monitor in different areas. Again, depending on the species, um, like African jeweled fish, you can use um, minnow traps can sometimes be a really good tool depending on the hat. Again, also another thing to think of is habitat. Habitat can be tricky for what mechanisms we're using. But um, yeah, so we're always, again, looking at new research. Some new research we're hoping to be able to support in the coming years has to really revolve around eDNA because eDNA has become such a better tool to use. We're seeing costs lower as, as more different more as eDNA mechanisms are becoming more efficient. And so we're hoping to see some more of that in the coming years to be able to monitor for non-native fish. And then if we find non-native fish, then we can set up a plan for how we're gonna try to control them. Depending on the area, if it's a very close system, possibly eradicate. I use that word very lightly when I talk about non-native and invasive species, but. <laughs> Thank you. Um, any more questions from the group? Well, uh, you know, plants are uh, my uh, area of expertise. I like them because they stay where they are, even though they can hide a little bit. Animals, um, that's amazing. Uh, the, the challenges you have to tackle are um, seems like quite a bit, but lots of great work. And I really appreciate the presentation. Um, and you. we'll go ahead and switch over to our SISMA update. We're getting some cool information from Central Florida SISMA. Um, Amanda, are you still with us? I'm here. Yay. <laughs> All right. Okay, let me see here. I'm just gonna share screen. Oh, ba -do -ba -do. Cool, okay. Hello everyone, my name is Amanda. Um, Deb reached out to me to uh, give you all a little insight into how our SISMA um, plans and hosts our grasses and sedges workshop, which is always a big hit. We get a lot of requests for this every year. Um, and it is a big undertaking to kind of plan and put this together, but we get a lot of great feedback for it. So I'm just gonna do a quick little presentation on um, how we get that done. So, oh wait, oh, okay. Um, so 
first step that our steering committee goes through is finding a location. Um, within our steering committee, we have IFAS Extension office agents um, from Seminole County, but we have hosted at the IFAS Orange County location in the past. Um, and then we also have um, FDEP State Park employees that are on our steering committee. So um, we have hosted at the Wakaiva State Park Youth Camp, which is where we hosted our most recent um, in the past as well. Uh, during COVID, we switched to online. So through IFIS, one of our members um, or one of our steering committee members, um, they have the Zoom webinar uh, that they pay for through IFIS. So we were able to use their um, account to host the online Zoom webinar, which I believe we had like over 200 people attend that one. Um, but we do prefer the in-person just because it's more fun to get together and go get our hands on some grasses as we're learning how to identify those species. So um, we have the webinar as well. And then, so once we find our event space, that kind of helps us A, pick a date and B, um, decipher what the cap capacity of our event is gonna be. So once we have our event space chosen, oh, okay. Yeah, so once we've got our event space, then we the next um, obvious necessary thing is to pick the date. So once we have our date and space and capacity, we go through this list of um, itinerary building. Um, so typically at least six months out, we start the conversation internally, start booking out the venue and start talking about um, possible speakers and hopeful topics. So. First, we kind of outline what topics we want to cover, and then using those topics, we'll um, internally talk about speakers that we've either seen in the past or people that we know are um, knowledgeable in that area, and then reach out to them to see if they can possibly speak. Um, around that time, we'll also send out sponsorship requests. So we have like a canned sponsorship request that um, we send out and then each person can kind of personalize it. But we send out um, requests to different contractors that um, we've all worked with in the past and we request Visa gift cards instead of checks um, so that we can kind of avoid some of the budgeting issues that I'm sure other SISMAs come into contact with um, since we're not necessarily 501c3s or our budget goes through, um, we partner with our um, Native Plant Society chapter to use their budget, but it's just gets complicated. So it's easier to um, go ahead and just do Visa gift cards. And then the sponsorship goes towards paying for the lunch. So that's about six months out once we know we have a date so we can figure out how much money we have to host lunch. Um, about three months out, we will confirm speakers and then request bios from each of them so that we can um, send in that CEU request. And then three months out around that same time, um, once we have confirmed our speakers, we will start building our itinerary and creating our promotional material, which is usually just a flyer. Um, and then roughly two months out, uh, once we have all of our bios confirmed and the itinerary built, then we are able to send all that information in to request CEUs. And then um, one of our members who, one of our uh, yeah chair members who is um, with the Seminole County IFAS Extension Office, she is a CEU officer. So she pushes all that through for the CEUs for us. Um, and then once we have the CEUs confirmed, that's when we start building our registration landing page um, because we really need to know, you know, what CEUs we're offering before we can start building that promo material. So we like to have that done about a month and a half out from the date. And then once everything is built, everything's confirmed, then we send out the announcement of that training roughly a month and a half um, out. So that's a lot of information. Um, and for us to keep track of it, since there's usually about at least 10 of us planning this event, we have a running Google Doc that um, we keep a running list of um, who's going to do what, who's going to reach out to who. And then when we come back for our next monthly meeting, um, we'll go through last month's um, topics and um, what we all said we would do and then circle back and see, okay, what was done, what wasn't done, what's confirmed, and then move forward from there. So 
here's just some screen grabs from our planning from the last meeting. So it shows, okay, here are some people that we brainstormed who was going to reach out to them. And then the highlighted information is, okay, they can't attend, they can't attend. So crossing off the list um, that was done, these people can or can't attend, and then moving forward from there. And then also here's a list of our CEUs and what was approved for that um, grasses workshop. And then also we have this table within there. So keeping um, our speaker list, their contact info, which I uh, grayed out, and then what sections they will lead, and then you know keeping track of whether or not they had confirmed, and then if they had sent their presentation into us as well. So that rolling Google Doc is super helpful um, for keeping track of all of our planning materials. And then as I mentioned for sponsorship, um, it's a canned request that we all send out to everyone. And then usually these are people we have some sort of working relationship with. So it's just a either a phone call or a text or a email like, hey, we're doing the workshop again. Would you guys be willing to send in a Visa gift card? Um, typically we request 50 to $100 and then we'll just ask for their logo to put on our sponsorship material. Um, and since we typically order like uh, Publix sandwiches for the the um, lunches, it's not too expensive. I believe this past round we had maybe $500 um, donated and that was enough to purchase everything. So here is just a quick snapshot of our most recent workshop itinerary. Um, pretty simple. And then here is our promotional flyer that we sent out. Um, having someone with IFIS on our steering committee has been super helpful because they have, they do all of these types of workshops all the time. So uh, they have their people create these, which in the past we've made them, they just weren't as pretty um, before we had IFIS people on our steering committee. But this is the beautiful flyer that was sent out for our most recent uh, October workshop. And you can see it has all of our CEUs on there, um, a link to registration, and then everyone that was involved. Oh, and I would like to mention that in order to have um, as many hands on deck for this most recent workshop, since two of us were out on maternity leave and one person was out of town, we had a lot of people out of town. So we actually co-hosted this event with um, Osceola Sisma and East Central Florida Sisma. So there was three Sismas on um, the planning of this one. So then for presentations, um, we have speakers send their presentations to us at least one week ahead. We start asking for them a month in advance and then um, we just need them the week before. And then we preload all of those onto the computer to avoid technical issues. Um, I will mention since this is at Wakaiva in the state park, they don't really have internet or like it's kind of spotty internet out there. So we like to have everything downloaded prior so that we can not run into some of the tech issues that can arise. Um, and I would like to mention that if it's online, I mean, obviously you would still want them, but people can share screens. So it's like less, less complicated if it's gonna be online. Um, but we have found that hybrid is just too difficult for us. Um, we've thrown around doing a hybrid event in the past, but either specifically online or specifically in person has worked out best for us. Um, the in-person is great is because because we can have um, field ID in the afternoon um, and then hosting somewhere like Wakaiva State Park is awesome because they burn. So their grasses are always great. And we do it in the fall. So those grasses are in bloom. Um, and then in the afternoon for that, um, I in the field IDs portion, we break out into advanced, intermediate. And then we usually have a couple different beginner groups so that we can take people out in the field and talk about the stuff we learned in the morning. And so that's pretty much the rough and tumble of how we plan our grass ID workshop. Um, if we have any other SISMAs that are hoping to plan workshops and have questions for me, I'm happy to take some questions. Thank you very much, Amanda. Um, your SISMA workshop for the grass ID especially is always so amazing. Uh, I got to participate in it several years ago and um, Great, great experience. So um, definitely the gold standard, I think, when it comes to Grass ID workshops. We love putting it on. I mean, I think it's fun for everybody. We really missed it uh, when we were stuck at home for those couple COVID years. <laughs> awesome. Any questions from anyone? 
All right. Well, I'm sure they'll have lots of questions when they come to your next round of the Grass ID workshop. I'm sure. <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, we will uh, switch over now. Let me start sharing my screen again and uh, continuing on um, with some of the great work that so the other people um, leading the Central Florida CISMA. I um, want to give a big th uh, shout out and thank you to some of the leads that are leaving now, Allegra. Tina and Morgan, um, instrumental in helping move that along. A big team, as you see, that goes into a lot of, not just the SISMA, but all different SISMAs. And um, the incoming leads for Central Florida will be Mark and Ron. So we're thankful for all that um, the leads do because without them, we wouldn't have great workshops um, like the grass ID or herbicide use, et cetera. Um, not just that, all the awesome events that we do. So kind of highlighting the Florida Weed Wrangle, which just ended um, last month. Our last call was in the middle of NISA and Weed Wrangle. Um, amazing work from all of our SISMAs this year. We had over 300 volunteers, almost 350 volunteers across the state in that 18 different sites and 24 different species removed. And so um, across the state, Caesar weed, Kalanchoe, air potato, and coral ardesia were common targets, but we had a lot. Um, and also some new records for a few different um, counties that were involved, some species that had not been documented there before. So really great to see so many people coming together to do some awesome work. Oh, another really interesting stat is um, 1,800 pounds, almost a ton of invasive plants were removed during these events. Um, some of the other upcoming events that we have coming um, over the next month, there are several work days all across the state. Um, the Florida Invasive Species Council is next, uh, annual symposium is next month. Uh, we have one more continuing weed wrangle up in the panhandle. Um, there's a Central Florida workshop in middle April. April. Um, and also I want to highlight Southwest Florida Sisma Invasive Freshwater Fish Roundup. So, you know, those of you that are interested in maybe trying to help remove, uh, help FWC remove some of their invasive species, especially fish, uh, another great opportunity to try and get involved with or to promote. Uh, again, also want to highlight a couple announcements, um, same as from last month. Fisk Symposium, the registration is still uh, open and available. It's going to be a great conference this year. And if you aren't involved with your um, FWC Uplands program, um, you want to check out that book. And a lot of the uh, different working groups are in the process right now, getting their presentations together and doing their planning meetings. Um, looking at the rest of our 2024 CISMA call, I'm pretty particularly excited about the next couple months um, of presentation. So next month, we're getting to highlight some of the student researchers within the Invasive Science um, Research Institute um, from UF. And we're seeing a broad array of the different research topics. And I think this is really cool to get to see not just how uh, invasive species affect our natural areas, but how they affect other aspects of our life. I think this is very important because in May, we'll start talking about how to um, communicate with the public. And so having that understanding of, um, you know, these different ways beyond just um, the impacts on our woods is a great thing to have as we're starting to talk to the public as they're engaging with us. And this month's call, as well as all others, are up available on our YouTube channel, um, which you can find at that link or just Googling the Florida Invasive Species Partnership. And uh, that is it for our call. I want to thank you all very much for uh, making time to be with us today. I hope you have a great month and we will see you next month.